Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is breast carcinoma, pathogenesis and classification. There is another video, breast carcinoma risk factors, that I highly recommend that you watch first. So a lot of research has been done on breast cancer and there are some very subtle nuances in, uh, between uh, different prognostic categories and morphologic variants. I'm not going to go into that much detail. Uh, this video will prepare you to do well in medical school and for uh, taking care of your patients. So with that in mind, I will be comparing and contrasting the three main biologic groups of breast cancer and the pathways that give rise to them, and describing the morphologic variants of breast cancer and their precursor lesions. So breast cancer, as I mentioned, is fairly common. It's the most common non-cutaneous malignancy in women. And worldwide, about 2 million women are diagnosed, uh, and about one-third will die of disease. The lifetime risk for a woman living to the age of 90 in the United States is 1 in 8. Uh, we do have improved uh, prognosis uh, due to uh, increased screening and improved treatment. Uh, mortality rate uh, has fallen from about 30% to less than 20% since the mid-1980s. Now, in uh, the previous video, I discussed uh, the uh, lesions that are associated with an increased risk of invasive carcinoma. Uh, first, we had our non-proliferative lesions that had no associated increased risk. Then we had our uh, proliferative lesions without atypia and our proliferative lesions with atypia. And I also mentioned ductal carcinoma in situ, but since this is actually a carcinoma and not uh, just a, a, a lesion that enhances risk, uh, that is being covered in this video. So having uh, carcinoma in situ uh, that is identified, for example, on biopsy, results in an 8 to 10-fold increase uh, in risk of invasive carcinoma. Now there are two types of uh, carcinoma in situ, ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, and lobular carcinoma in situ, or LCIS. Uh, this is uh, a clonal uh, proliferation that's limited by the basement membrane. Uh, and as you'll recall, in the uh, healthy uh, duct or acinus, we have a two-cell population with myoepithelial cells snuggled up against the basement membrane, and then your luminal epithelium. Uh, ductal carcinoma in situ is usually detected uh, as a mammographic uh, density or due to calcifications. Uh, and it can be associated with a rare finding called Paget disease of the nipple, which I'll cover in a moment. Uh, the other type uh, of carcinoma in situ is lobular carcinoma in situ, which is a uniform population of round cells uh, that are discohesive, so they don't stick together very well, and they look uh, identical to what we see in atypical lobular hyperplasia. So let's begin first by looking at our DCIS. Uh, here you can see an image that I showed in that earlier video. This is showing these punched out uh, areas, uh, these very rigid gland-like structures. And here you can appreciate some calcifications or some arrows uh, denoting them here. And then this is another type of uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, which is referred to as comedotype. Uh, a comedone is uh, a pimple, and as you uh, are aware, if you open uh, the surface of a pimple or comedone, you get the release of pus, which is somewhat uh, necrotic material. Uh, this ductal carcinoma in situ has similar uh, necrotic material at its center. Uh, and if you were to cut that, you'll get a pasty material. Uh, and the reason uh, this is of particular importance is because this is a higher grade type of uh, carcinoma in situ. Uh, and when we see this necrosis, remember from early on uh, in the first chapter of Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology uh, that we can get dystrophic calcification of this necrotic material. And what will that look like? Here you can see another example of uh, ductal carcinoma in situ with calcifications of this necrotic material, which we can then see uh, on mammograms. So you can see these densities here uh, that are highlighting uh, these calcifications. So when a, a radiologist sees this on a mammogram, it raises uh, the concern that there could be a ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, the other finding I want to share with you is something called Paget disease of the nipple. Uh, patients can present with uh, a unilateral erythematous or hyperpigmented uh, lesion that's scaly. Uh, and this appearance uh, looks uh, like eczema, uh, but if uh, the patient is treated with steroids, uh, it does not go away. Uh, and what we can see here is that this is due to uh, ductal carcinoma in situ extending from 
uh, up from the breast via the lactiferous ducts to the nipple skin. So here we have a section of skin from the nipple, and you can see these nests of ductal carcinoma in situ uh, here uh, at the dermal epidermal junction. Now again, this is ductal carcinoma in situ. This is not invasive carcinoma here, so it does not cross a basement membrane. However, it does disrupt the, ep disrupt the epithelial barrier, which can lead to uh, fluid seepage and that scaly uh, appearance uh, of the skin. Now about 50 to 60 percent of uh, individuals who have Paget disease of the nipple uh, do have a palpable mass and most of those will be an invasive carcinoma. If, however, a patient presents simply with the skin findings and no mass can be felt, uh, it is most likely that patient simply has ductal carcinoma in situ. So that finishes up our DCIS. Let's now take a look at our lobular carcinoma in situ. And again, this is an image that I showed you in that earlier video. Lobular carcinoma in situ tends to be an incidental uh, biopsy finding. So uh, perhaps a biopsy is being performed because of calcifications or a mammogram uh, mammographic density. And this will just be something that uh, comes along for the ride and is noted. Uh, the reason uh, that this is an incidental finding is because uh, it doesn't cause a density or calcification. Now, about 20 to 40 percent of the time, uh, lobular carcinoma in situ uh, is bilateral. Uh, and what uh, we can uh, find here is that these cells have lost E cadherin. So that's that uh, protein important for our intercellular junctions. Uh, losing that allows them to be discohesive. And when we take a look at what uh, invasive lobular carcinoma looks like, you'll see how this discohesion manifests. So now that we've talked about our two precursor lesions, we now need to shift into invasive breast carcinoma. Uh, and this can be a little complicated because we have uh, two ways that we look at breast cancer. One is on the biologic uh, group, and another is a morphologic finding. And for most of you who are taking care of patients, what will be important is going to be the biologic group, because that will be what determines what uh, treatment those patients receive. And I'll explain that more in a little bit more detail. Let's begin by looking at the biologic group. So first we need to recognize that almost all cancers of the breast are adenocarcinomas. And they are going to be uh, classified into their biologic groups based on the expression of three proteins. So estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the protein HER2. Now estrogen receptor uh, we talked about uh, in the previous video uh, because lifetime exposure uh, to estrogen as that increases, increases risk of breast cancer. And the reason is, is that uh, many genes are regulated by estrogen. Progesterone receptor uh, tends to be co-expressed with estrogen receptor. Uh, we don't typically give um, uh, chemotherapy that uh, blocks progesterone receptor. We focus more on estrogen. And then the uh, third uh, protein we look at is HER2, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase. Uh, and what it does is it increases cell proliferation while decreasing apoptosis, which is going to take us to a higher proliferative state. And it does this through stimulating RAS and PI3K AKT signaling. Uh, so let's look now at what our three uh, main biologic groups of breast uh, carcinoma are. So we have luminal, HER2, and triple negative. So luminal is about 50 to 65 percent of cases, and these individuals have tumors that are positive for estrogen receptor and negative for HER2. And you can see the full spectrum of morphologic findings in luminal breast cancer from very well differentiated cancers to very poorly differentiated cancers. Uh, when uh, individuals have germline BRCA2 mutations, the cancer tends to be of the luminal subtype. The second uh, biologic type is HER2, uh, and these are tumors uh, that are positive for HER2, and they can be positive or negative for estrogen receptor uh, as well as progesterone receptor, because the important point here is HER2, and the way that we uh, are HER2 positive is through gene amplification in more than 95% of cases. And then the final category is triple negative. This is called this because it's negative for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2. And when individuals have germline BRCA1 mutations, uh, they tend to have triple negative malignancies. And this is uh, a biologically aggressive uh, tumor which has a worse prognosis. So before uh, we go into the differences between these, I just want to give you a peek at how we diagnose uh, HER2.
Uh, you can see here, uh, this is uh, showing uh, the chromosome, chromosome 17, where we have uh, just the regular number of uh, copy number of HER2. We use another uh, probe that we can, so that we can quantitate the number of chromosomes we're assessing. And here, when we have one copy of HER2 and one copy of CEP17 on each chromosome, we have two red and two green signals. By contrast, in this HER2 positive uh, tumor, uh, we have amplification of HER2. We still only have uh, one of our green signals, so there's two that we're looking at there, and you can see how much HER2 there is, all these little red signals. We can also look at this uh, using immunohistochemistry. This is one uh, that is showing no staining at all. This is the HER2 negative, and when we have um, abundant uh, HER2 amplification, we can see this uh, staining here. So why do we care about dividing them into these various categories? It's because these three biologic categories tell us a lot about uh, prognosis uh, and uh, timing of relapse, uh, things like that. So let's take a look at them one by one. So we'll begin with our luminal uh, carcinoma, which is the most common, and tends to uh, affect older women. Uh, also, when men develop uh, breast cancer, uh, this is the type they typically have. Uh, luminal cancers are typically detected by screening, uh, and as I already mentioned, their association with germline BRCA2. Uh, by contrast, HER2 uh, tumors are in younger women, and again, are germline TP53. And finally, uh, our triple negative uh, tends to be in young women, again associated with germline BRCA1. And as we discussed in the earlier video, there's an association with uh, the socially defined race of African American. Uh, grade uh, varies across these. We uh, grade invasive carcinoma on a three-tiered system. So grade one, well differentiated, grade two, moderately differentiated, and grade three, poorly differentiated. Uh, luminal tumors are mainly going to be uh, low to moderate compared to HER2, which is typically moderate to poorly differentiated, and triple negative, which is mainly uh, uh, grade, grade three. Uh, and we can see here the response to chemotherapy also varies across uh, these tumors with about 10% uh, of luminal tumors responding, 15% uh, versus 30 to 60%, depending on e whether ER is positive or negative, because as you recall, for HER2 tumors, uh, they can be either ER positive or ER negative. And then our triple negative tumors uh, respond about 30% of the time. Now you may be saying, well, but how come triple negative is a worse tumor if we can see that we get complete response to chemotherapy more commonly in triple negative? And that's because this is a more aggressive disease biologically, whereas luminal tends to be uh, more indolent and has a low rate of relapse uh, over many years. What we see in contrast with triple negative uh, is that uh, we have an early peak uh, and once they survive that early peak, late recurrence is rare. However, the real difference between these two is that in luminal cancer, uh, long survival is possible, uh, particularly with bone metastases, whereas in triple negative uh, malignancies, survival with metastases is very rare. Uh, the important issue here about timing of relapse is because, um, uh, you know, just because a patient had a diagnosis of breast cancer 20 years ago does not mean that that individual is cured. Uh, and if uh, they uh, present, for example, with uh, hip pain, uh, that may be due to metastatic disease. It uh, needs to be evaluated carefully. I uh, don't just think, well, it's probably just arthritis. So go ahead and do that evaluation. And then just to finish up our timing of relapse for our HER2, we tend to have a bimodal distribution with early uh, and late peaks. Uh, finally, uh, for the metastatic sites, uh, just one thing to point out is that all three of these tend to metastasize to bone, so that's a very common presentation. Keep that in mind when you have uh, patients who present with bone pain, because that can be due to metastatic disease. And they have a variable distribution in the viscera and brain. Uh, I've simplified this a little bit from the table in Robbins, the common somatic mutations, uh, PIK, uh, 3CA, uh, and then TP53 uh, for these two. So uh, we have these three uh, different biologic uh, categories with different characteristics. We have three pathways of carcinogenesis. So I'm going to go through these uh, here, and then I'm going to show you uh, a figure.
Uh, so for our ER pathway, this will be for our luminal carcinoma, so ER positive, HER2 negative. Uh, and what we will tend to see here will be either a germline BRCA2 mutation in our familial cases, or we'll get PIK3CA mutations. Now remember, uh, PIK3CA, this was discussed in the neoplasia uh, chapter, uh, is a signaling pathway downstream from growth uh, factor receptors. In our HER2, again, uh, we'll see uh, that we can get a germline TP53 mutation in our familial cases, or amplification, as I showed you in that earlier image of HER2. And then what we refer to as a DNA damage pathway, this is what we see in our triple negative carcinomas, uh, is that we will get either um, uh, familial cases with germline BRCA1, or we will get TP53 mutations, followed by uh, epigenetic silencing of BRCA1 in our sporadic cases. So just to point out, we don't typically see mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 in sporadic breast cancers. We only see those in our familial cancers, but we can get epigenetic uh, inactivation. And this brings me uh, to talk about uh, germline mutations uh, with a little bit more detail. I talked about it briefly uh, in the previous video. So just to remember, about 10% of breast cancers are familial, uh, and that the genes that are involved tend to be involved in uh, proteins that regulate genomic stability or play a role in pro-growth signaling pathways. And we consider these to be either high penetrance uh, genes or moderate penetrance genes. This was, again, uh, discussed uh, briefly. Uh, in the previous video. And the reason I want to linger over this for a moment is because there's uh, so much attention paid to BRCA1 and BRCA2. I don't want you to forget that these other genes exist. So if you do have a patient with familial breast cancer, BRCA1, BRCA2 negative, uh, it's worth checking out uh, these other genes. So as you'll recall from our neoplasia chapter, BRCA1 and BRCA2 function in the repair of double-stranded DNA breaks, and they have the associations with these types of breast cancer. Uh, TP53, you're very familiar with. Uh, P10 was also discussed in the neoplasia chapter. This is a negative regulator of the PI3K and AKT pathway. And then uh, just to remind you about CDH1, which encodes the protein E cadherin. Now, this came up uh, in our earlier discussion in neoplasia when we were talking about the WENT signaling pathway because E. cadherin also will bind to beta-catenin, which is involved in that pathway. But it also plays a role here. It's involved in cell-cell uh, um, uh, binding, so in our intercellular uh, reactions. And uh, what we see here is that loss of this leads to this discohesion, allowing cells to float about uh, individually. And we discussed this uh, in the context of neoplasia. So we tend to see mutations in CDH1, in lobular breast carcinoma, as well as in hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, uh, which uh, uh, I discuss in another video. Uh, and then just this uh, one example here, check two, uh, most of these uh, tumors are ER positive. So with all of this put together, now let's take a look at a figure from Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. You can see here we have healthy breast, and then it goes down one of these three pathways. We can have uh, either our germline BRCA2 mutation, and this can lead to um, a precursor lesion called flat epithelia atypia, certainly not something that medical students need to be able to recognize. Uh, subsequently, we can get our PIK3CA mutations, which is going to lead to our atypical ductal hyperplasia. Finally, we get additional mutations leading to DCIS and additional leading us to our luminal uh, cancer. And just to point out, there's a lot of research going on. There are a lot of steps in here that we don't understand all of. So uh, just keep in mind, there's a lot of detail here that um, still remains to be discovered. For our HER2 pathway, this can either uh, be manifested with a germline TP53 mutation, and then we get our HER2 amplification leading to our ductal carcinoma in situ and our HER2 tumors. And then finally, in our DNA damage pathway, we can either have our germline BRCA1 mutation, followed by our TP53 mutations, uh, BRCA1 inactivation, and our sporadic tumors leading to our DCIS and our triple negative tumors. So with that in mind, those are our biological uh, categories, and that's what you'll be looking at in your pathology report to help you determine uh, therapy. And we'll talk about that at the end of this video. But there's another way that we uh, consider these tumors, and that is their morphologic appearance. And the way that we've ca characterized this is either invasive carcinoma of no special type, which is the most common type, about two-thirds of cases, 
and invasive carcinoma of special types, or about one third of cases. And there are two big ones you really need to know. One is a no special type, and that's going to be invasive ductal carcinoma, and the other is a special type, and that is uh, invasive lobular carcinoma. So let's begin with our no special types here. As I mentioned, ductal carcinoma is the one to be aware of because it's about 70 to 80 percent of the invasive carcinoma of no special type. Uh, and basically, uh, what we'll see is um, the full range of, uh, of grade and morphology. So they may be well differentiated tubules, or they can be full on sheets of anaplastic cells. It tends to be associated with ductal carcinoma in situ, DCIS, and is often identified uh, in uh, patients with a very small mass or non palpable mass uh, through uh, mammographic uh, calcifications. Uh, this uh, can also occur through a desmoplastic response to this invasive carcinoma, which can lead to a mammographic density. Now, I want to just mention one other invasive carcinoma of no special type. Uh, this is medullary carcinoma, and the reason I want to mention it is because uh, previously, uh, previous generations of medical students were taught that this had a, uh, a good prognosis. Uh, that is now not considered to be the case, and I want to make sure that you are aware of this moving forward. And I just have to show a picture of it uh, for you here. This tends to be sheets of large pleomorphic cells. They've got very prominent nucleoli, frequent mitotic figures. Uh, you can appreciate a little bit of the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate here and they tend to have very rounded borders as opposed to the stellate appearance uh, that we see typically with invasive carcinoma. And they're uh, associated with loss of function of BRCA1, either through mutation or uh, epigenetic silencing through hypermethylation. So that's all you need to know about medullary carcinoma. Let's return back to our invasive ductal carcinoma. Here again is the DCIS uh, that we uh, looked at earlier, where we have our calcifications. Now this is what happens. We've broken through uh, that uh, basement membrane. And you can see this dense fibrosis. This is this desmoplastic reaction uh, to these invasive tubules. And if we did special stains, we would see there are no myoepithelial cells. These are simply those luminal cells that are invading. Uh, and just uh, as a pearl, uh, tumors that have these well-differentiated tubules tend to be uh, ER positive as well as PR positive. Okay, so now let's talk about our special types of invasive carcinoma. The big dog here is going to be invasive lobular carcinomas because that accounts for 10 to 15 percent of invasive carcinomas and is um, characterized by, as I mentioned, a biallelic loss of CDH1, our e cadherin protein. And these individual cells that invade tend to uh, provoke a minimal or no desmoplastic reaction. So we're not going to see these as mammographic densities. They also don't make uh, calcification, so we won't find them through mammography. Uh, they tend to uh, metastasize in an unusual pattern uh, to the peritoneum, uh, retroperitoneum, uh, leptomeninges, gastrointestinal tract, and ovaries and uterus. Uh, this, in particular, to the GI tract can be a pitfall because it can uh, metastasize to the stomach where it may mimic uh, diffuse intestinal uh, stomach cancer. Now, there, uh, we'll look at this in a moment, but I want to address these other special types uh, simply because they're, um, they're mentioned in Robin's and it's worth talking about them briefly. So we have our mucinous or colloid carcinoma, which is characterized by abundant uh, extracellular mucin. Uh, and then we have tubular carcinoma, which shows uh, very well-formed tubules and tends to be um, uh, very uh, well circumscribed. Uh, and then the final one I want to discuss is inflammatory carcinoma. Now, this is not uh, a type of uh, a histologic type, and it's not inflammatory, but it's an important uh, clinical um, uh, prognostic indicator. So let's take a look at this first, and then we'll touch on our other cases. So here uh, we're looking at an example of a mastectomy uh, with inflammatory carcinoma. And you can see here that the skin appears uh, roughened. Uh, often it is erythematous and swollen uh, and has thickening, uh, which is referred to as looking like an orange skin or peau d'orange. And what causes this appearance is that we've got extensive plugging of our dermal lymphatic spaces with carcinoma. Uh, and because uh, we get swelling, the lymph cannot leave, uh, and it's pulling against Cooper's ligaments, it has this uh, sort of roughened appearance. 
Now, there is no inflammation that we see here, uh, and inflammatory carcinoma tends to be associated with diffusely infiltrative carcinoma. And because of that diffuse infiltration, as well as a frequent delay in diagnosis, because it's thought that this may represent an infection, some cellulitis, uh, this uh, particular uh, type of carcinoma tends to have a poor prognosis with a three-year survival rate of only 3 to 10 percent. Let's just touch briefly on the morphologic appearance of our tubular carcinoma, uh, just so you can say that you've seen it. And I think it's really quite remarkable, this mucinous carcinoma, how much mucin you can see. These are really just floating uh, in little lakes of mucin. But now let's return to uh, what I referred to as, as the big dog of the special types. That's our invasive lobular carcinoma. So you can see that these uh, monomorphic uh, rounded cells that we saw in our, um, our uh, lobular carcinoma in situ are the same cells that we're going to see here in our invasive lobular carcinoma. Because they're discohesive, they're not invading as glands, but rather uh, as single cells or in these chains. Uh, and this is a very characteristic appearance, and we do not see a strong desmoplastic uh, reaction. Now, as I mentioned, they have an unusual metastatic pattern. Uh, this is a resection uh, from uh, the stomach. This is the gastric wall. Uh, you can make out the gastric glands here, and you can also notice it just seems a little bit too cellular. Uh, now, we can uh, think of this perhaps as inflammatory cells, but we can confirm our suspicion that this may be um, a, a metastatic uh, lobular carcinoma with an immunohistochemical stain for keratin, which is going to highlight uh, not only each of these well-formed uh, epithelial uh, glands, but also these individual cells. And this mimics very closely a diffused gastric carcinoma, so you'll want to do additional stains to confirm that. So this brings us now to uh, the final discussion, which is breast cancer treatment. So there are two goals to this, uh, controlling local disease and prolonging survival. Uh, so in order to control local disease, there are two uh, options. One is breast conserving surgery, also referred to colloquially as a lumpectomy uh, with radiation therapy. Alternatively, patients may elect to undergo a mastectomy, uh, for example, if they do not wish to undergo uh, radiation therapy or if they have uh, multiple tumors in one breast. Uh, the other uh, consideration is prolonging survival. So for uh, individuals with estrogen receptor positive tumors, we'll use endocrine therapy that can block the estrogen receptor, uh, or we can use estrogen deprivation. For uh, HER2 positive tumors, we're going to treat with antibodies to HER2. Uh, and then finally, if we have uh, tumors that are highly proliferative, so they've got a very high mitotic rate, we're going to use uh, cytotoxic uh, systemic chemotherapy. It is uh, it's not as targeted as these others, uh, but uh, is a way to address this uh, high proliferation. Uh, and there are, of course, additional uh, more targeted therapies in the pipeline. Uh, as always, uh, here are some questions. You may want to hit pause and see how you do on them. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you for your time and attention. I hope you have found this useful. I know that breast cancer is a really big topic, uh, but uh, this uh, should provide a solid foundation for you. So thank you very much for your time and attention.